So today I'm going to make a little content about how to set up and plan for your solar project. Now this is a really complicated and very personal to the user kind of conversation. So take with this that there's a lot of variability and location, availability of mounting and otherwise accessories and budget and things like that play a lot into this. So this is just a loose fitted guide of some steps to think about when you're planning your system. Now I get a ton of questions about how, why my system is so big. You're looking at one side of my barn, the other side over there has an additional 40 panels. So I have 31.6 kilowatts of solar. Now that's because not only do I use a lot of power, I have a 3,800 square foot house, I have a pool, I have a farm with a barn, I have another outbuilding here. I actually run my own well, so there's a well pump that runs, and I'm going to be getting in that same well pump house right there, I'll be getting another larger pump that will be pumping my pond, which is on the front side of the property. So my demand for electricity, as it were last year, was about 30 megawatts over the course of a single year. Now, that is a ton of power. That's an average of about 25 hundred kilowatts per month. Now today is a great day for this demonstration because I just topped out at a hundred percent state of charge on my battery bank, which is another thing I get a ton of questions about, which is why is this such a large battery room? Or why do I have so many batteries and inverters? So let me quickly explain this. I have currently I have four of these 18K PVs, and in that, each one handles two strings of 10 panels. So they're all balanced evenly with the inputs. Each one has its own three batteries that it's supported by, although those batteries are part of a continuous bank. Let me turn the light on in here, make it a little bit brighter. There we go, better lighting. So there are 12 batteries and four 18K PVs. This is before the Grid Boss and the Flex Boss came out. So this was my best option to support not only the number of batteries connected, but for the solar input, and most specifically, the output for each one of these without grid bypass is 50 amps. So for that, all of those 50 amp outputs are brought to this, my AC combiner box. Now you can see this is the blue inverter, green inverter, and you can see these metal tags inside there. Those are the back feed lockout. So you can't pull those breakers out. So this is all to code. They're all labeled and each battery bank is accordingly labeled with the colors and so is the inverter that runs it. So it's all color coded. It all goes in here. Each one of these 50 amps go into a combined 200 amp transfer or uh, switch main breaker that then runs in that trench there around to the front of my house. So my house is completely off grid. Some people will ask, well, why don't you just do grid tide? Well, where I live, grid tide has a limitation of 10 kilowatts. Now, if I put 10 kilowatts exactly at the right angle, so based on my latitude on the globe and the bearing of the sun during the most productive months, so summer months, so let's say it's a 33 degree angle or whatever it might be, directly south facing, then that 10 kilowatts might be pretty close to 10 kilowatts of production during that one time. But otherwise, that's not going to be the case. So knowing that my mounting was going to be on the roof of this building, which again, we'll go back outside and look at that from the ground, just so that we have good point of reference. We can say hi to the new puppies. That's little Zara. She's a little fantastic monster. Now you can see we have all of those panels on this side are pretty shaded because the sun is setting over on this, the Western side of the house or the barn rather. And because I already have this structure and I didn't want to take up my paddocks with something that the goats would jump on, this structure is where I wanted to mount my solar panels. So I basically would have had three rows. I would have had one of these double sets and another one above it. And that would have been the maximum that my utility would have allowed me to have if I had any interactivity with the grid, even if 
I was using grid bypass mode. So even if I was not back feeding to the grid, I could not have gotten this system approved if the grid was plugged in at any point in this system. So there is a 200 amp transfer switch at the house that is manual. And it means that I can't sell back to the grid and I can't have grid coming into the house at the same time as this system. So your limitations might be similar. So check with your utility and your county for the codes and requirements for what you can do. So that being said, this is my system and the path that I took to set it up. You can see here, we're limiting the input of the PV because we hit 100% right around 2.30 or so. And you can see the PV drop off here, the blue line drops off significantly, but we're keeping the state of charge at 100%. 3000 watts are coming in, which is just basically feeding the house entirely. So all the batteries are top balanced today. We're just letting that happen. Um, as I prepare for the pump to come in. Now, if you're doing this yourself, if you're planning for this type of a large scale or small scale system, there are a few things that you wanna consider. First is that interconnect. So the interconnect is how do you interact with the grid that you have available to you? Do you need batteries? And if not, then maybe just use the grid for overnight when energy, if it is time of use, which mine is, is generally cheaper. So look at the interconnect, grid tied versus off grid, so on and so forth. Then look at your budget. What amount of money do you have available to you to spend on this? That will dictate how much you can afford. But additionally, the skills that you personally have versus what you can DIY and what you probably have to have someone else do. Some counties require that you do the work um, by a licensed uh, professional. And if it's over a certain dollar amount, like if this were more expensive than this was, I would have had to have a professional electrician do it, which is a silly abstract rule, but it is one that my county follows. So knowing the skills, the requirements of your county and your budget help you kind of limit how much you can get away with with doing it yourself versus having someone else do it, which would typically cost you more and so on. So also think about the tax credits. So for me, this system is fully commissioned before the end of last year. I actually got my certificate of occupancy from the county on the 31st of December, just in the nick of time. And I was able to file my taxes this year and get my 30% tax credit with this. Obviously, if you don't understand how credits work and your understanding of tax code is not that great, look that up. Talk to a tax um, agent or some tax professional to under or CPA, whatever you want to refer to them as, to understand it more holistically so that you can be aware of what you can and can't do and how much of the credit you might be able to consume in a single year. Then when it comes to the scale of this, if you can see this room, this is a very large room and it is filled to the brim with batteries and inverters. It also gets very warm and I have an AC unit for this room specifically. I also have Wi-Fi out here to run all the information back to the house, whole nine yards. But if you don't have this room, where would you mount these batteries outside? So planning spatially, where this equipment would go would be another step of your project. So understanding how much space is available, not only for the equipment, but the solar itself. Is this solar going to be on a roof? And if it's on a roof, you have to derate the solar based on its pitch and orientation relative to south and the altitude to it, or your latitude rather that you sit at. So you might lose some output. Now, that being said, I would assume it's about 15% if you're not facing south of the total solar production, if it's, if it's an east-west configuration instead. You'll also then have to consider what is the angle of the solar that you might lose an additional 10 or 15% on that as well. So if it's a flat pitch roof, and you'll notice my barn had some flat lows and some tilted, a little bit higher, steeper pitched roofs. So that is another consideration, is where would you derate and by how much? 
Uh, I think my total consideration of my system was roughly at about 67% derated of what it could produce. And right now, my maximum output that I've gotten in a single day is 22 kilowatt hours simultaneously at once. So peak of the day when the sun is directly overhead, that's when I'll obviously get the most. Then once you go through, okay, this is where I can put it. This is how much budget I have. This is how much I can DIY. This is how much I need to have someone else help me with. And I've kind of got this foundational understanding. Well, now what equipment am I going to use? I prefer systems that are fully integrated. So these inverters are built to be coupled with these batteries and they also have these conduit boxes those make this setup super easy and intuitive so if you're unfamiliar with how to set things up not only is this equipment easier to set up but the support from eg4 and signature solar is astonishing so if you're looking for something that has a good quality product and great support I would recommend them, but there's probably other brands out there that could be recommended similarly. This is just the one that I personally chose. And if I had to choose again, I would pick them again and again. They helped the design and the setup and the support throughout this entire project. So they have been fantastic. They also have a Facebook group where they will answer questions within minutes. And there's a huge community following that also helps with that exact thing. So consider the place where you get your solar if you're not really well versed in it to find the solution that has a great community of support. Now on the idea of support, you wanna think about where are you going to get your resources for information. So some really great places for that would be Will Prowse on YouTube is the absolute best source for information on solar equipment, batteries, and specifically off-grid applications of solar installations. He does some on-grid stuff, uh, but very sparingly. Uh, absolutely the best knowledgeable individual on this topic. So Will Prowse, I think it's DIY Solar with Will Prowse. He has a book. Uh, and he also owns DIY Solar Forums, which is one of the best forums for solar. So if you're not in there and you're just trying to kind of learn, go in there, become a consumer of what questions are being asked, how people are answering them and how people are helping each other. Solar community is very robust of people willing to help one another. So jump into that early before you start planning your build. People will be glad to help you. Now, another thing that I personally went through because I did all of this myself, so I wanted to know how to be NEC compliant. So National Electric Code is a series of requirements for the minimum safety for operating electrical equipment in all sorts of different applications. But in this case, residential solar, I think that's uh, 690 is that category primarily. And there are some other subsections that discuss it. Now, if you're gonna be the nerd like myself who goes down the rabbit hole of NEC, Mike Holt of MikeHolt.com and Mike Holt NEC is on YouTube and he is an NEC um, individual who, I think he helps write the actual code and they do the sessions about how they dissect the code and how it was written previously and what updates are being made. Now, he is someone who puts all of this on the internet for everyone to consume and benefit from. So if you're looking to get a ton of information, that is where I would start. DIY Solar Forums, if you're on Facebook, the Signature Solar EG4 Users Group, and uh, Will Prowse as well on YouTube. Now, if you start your journey there and just start kind of consuming a little bit of knowledge at a time, you'll be ahead of the ball when you start planning out those harder parts of the projects, which is, are you going to be grid tied? Are you going to be in, like in some way interconnected? What does that mean? How many batteries? And you're scaling and you're doing all of that work. So I would start with the information stage and then work your way back to what you need. So you can at least understand some of the language, the differences between what is a kilowatt versus a kilowatt hour. Simple analogy there, a mile is different from a mile an hour in that one is measured over time. And so a lot of folks get caught up in some of the nomenclature and try and do things without enough understanding to do it well. The final thing that I'll add, this in my operation is a ton of batteries. And I get asked all the time, why do I need so many batteries? 
Well, not only is the house in a high demand, but you have to think about days of autonomy. And here on this display at the bottom, this is just the month of February so far. And these little lines represent how much solar production and how much consumption. You can see that navy blue line is my production for the day. And you notice only in these last few days has it been really tall and then it's been really sparing. Well, the sun isn't as high on the horizon as it is in the summer during the winter months. Now, additionally, you'll get cloudy days that you're using a ton of power. And you'll notice my state of charge for my batteries, which has gone down significantly, and that's the purple-ish, it's hard to see the color here. But on like this day here, I'll click on, and it will tell me where my state of charge was, um, down to this one here. Now, my charge, Date, or my charge data there is telling me what I got into the batteries, but what it got down to was about 10 kilowatt hours worth of battery out of 176 or 72 kilowatt hours. And so if I had had one more heavily cloudy day, I wouldn't have had power and I would have had to switch back to the grid, which would have been me going outside and manually switching that transfer switch. So there are a few days in the year where even this large of a battery setup because the way we heat our houses in the South is with electric energy through mini splits and otherwise HVAC units, then the electric heating function of a house consumes a ton of energy. And if it's cloudy, you're not producing enough energy to build back that storage. So days of autonomy is something you will hear about that while you're planning the usage and how much you need to build for, you wanna think about the number of days of autonomy that you want to be able to have the system run for if you go into something that is like a fully off-grid system like this. So that little asterisk that I just added at the end is really mostly applicable to only anyone who is doing off-grid specific like this setup here. If you're going grid tied, that is not a piece of calculation you need to do unless you're in a hurricane zone where you wanna think through that, where most hurricanes happen is in the fall, so it's usually sunny and you don't have to think about that. But that's just one little asterisk to add at the end of this. But I hope that helps if you're thinking about planning your own system or if you're someone who's been asking a million questions about this system as to why it's as big as it is and uh, what the total specs are. So we have four 18 PVs, we've got 12 of the Power Pro batteries and 80 of the 395 sol Canadian solar uh, solar panel modules. And one last call out, and I'll do this just for those users who've been saying they would never use a snap and rack top speed rack mount. Oh, look at this baby goat, perfect timing. That name is Star. She's a cute pie. She's such a baby. Oh, here she comes. Hey, girly. So for those who think that drilling holes in a roof is a terrible idea, Maybe you're right, but there are all those holes and we get persistent rain here and not a single leak has happened. Now, what you'll also see on the bottom side of this is nail holes everywhere because that's how shingles are mounted to a roof. So everywhere that you see a nail hole is no different than where you see the screw holes because they're also cocked the same way. So the entire rack system, which is the top speed snap and rack um, mounts is how I've mounted this entire solar array. So we'll go outside just to end it here with these little units right there, which clip on to the edge of the solar panel and then screw right into the roof. They make mounting super fast and easy. And because this barn was built in different sections, the flatness of the roof was not perfect. But with those, I was able to level out the surface very easily and make a nice array. And again, it has rained a lot here in the two months that I've had these holes in the roof and not a single leak has come through. So for those who are curious, snap and rack top speed mounts don't make your roof leak. Bad installers do. And your house has just as many holes from nails as it does from the screws from those pieces of hardware. Have any questions, put them down in the comments below. And uh, if, you, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up.